dive into a, an evolution that's rapidly changing the retail world right now. Some of you are looking for jobs. Maybe this could be eye-opening for you. If you're not in retail and you know you're not going to be, here's the challenge for you tonight. I wanted to, to really lead off of what Gary talked about in June. Some of you were here for Gary's discussion in June, or some of you saw Matt's outstanding posting on, on YouTube for Gary's uh, segment on, on, uh, supply, on empowering you in the supply chain field to really change your companies. So we're going to continue that theme tonight. And we're going to use the retail industry as an example, but only as an example of how all of us in this room can change our companies, not just from a supply chain perspective, but really looking at the business objectives of the larger organizations that we're part of. We're going to take it from the theoretical and then into the practical tonight. But let's address the difference between supply chain management and supply chain strategy. There's an enormous difference. Now, supply chain management is what a lot of us in the room spend our lives on. It's traditional supply chain, inbound, outbound, warehousing, but it's in a silo. We're held accountable to our own KPIs, our own indices. They, in turn, reflect in our raises, our performance reviews. But supply chain management often doesn't take into account the full business objectives of the overall organization. And that's where we get into supply chain strategy and where we're going to head tonight. So again, as we go through this time together, Think about your own role that you play in your company and think about how you can challenge yourself to go beyond that role and interact with your peers from other operating divisions to really take your company to a new level. So since we don't have many retailers in the room, I just want to level set and make sure everybody's on the same page when we talk about a traditional retail supply chain. So everything you great folks have learned in school, right? Got product coming in from overseas, could be domestic sourcing, coming in to for a variety of methods, usually ocean in the retail world, some air freight for those last minute inventory that needs to get here for the holiday season. Uh, it could be truckload coming in from the domestic suppliers, coming into a few main warehouses. And if you're in retail, you know that the large retailers have always split their warehouses for the warehouses that are gonna fulfill the stores. We'll call those the retail warehouses. And then they've got separate warehouses for their online business unit distribution. So everything you and I order online comes from a separate warehouse. So think of the difference between those two warehouses. In the retail one, you've got cartons coming in from Asia, from overseas. Those cartons are cross docked they're not open because the store can take those whole cartons at the same level, of the same type of skew. On the other hand, the e-commerce or the online business unit usually breaks open those cartons and fulfills just the one or two things that you and I order online, right? So entirely different setup. Now we step down from the largest retailers in the industry to your mid-sized ones. They may share one geographical warehouse, but they usually split it and the management team is different, entirely different metrics, entirely different accountability. <coughs> They're run absolutely independently. The inventory is not viewed collectively. It's viewed for the retail and then for the online business unit. And so what, we're, what you see in a traditional environment is that there's sub-optimization. There's people coming to work every day like you do. And they're doing their very best to meet their KPIs and their metrics but they're not taking into account the larger business organization. So you look at a warehouse manager, his job is to get the inventory in and out as efficiently as possible. You look at an inbound supply chain manager, maybe some of you are, you're responsible for getting the goods in. And you usually have a different outbound supply chain manager, right? And again, different for e-commerce and retail. So what we've got here is an organization working dysfunctionally we're all supply, we're all, most of us involved in supply chain, our lives are about efficiency, industrial engineering, we like to optimize. This is not an optimal equation, right? Different people negotiating different, cons different transportation contracts. Maybe there's people who work with, with 
Michelle's team back there on the UPS small, pa small package side, folks working with the air and ocean uh, agreements there. But these folks don't even talk together in a lot of cases. So some of you are in consulting, right, in this room. And we come in, I'm a consultant, I have a team of consultants that work in micro. We come in and help these largest retailers and, and similar size companies. We have different sectors at UPS that we represent, healthcare, high tech, government professional services. And what traditionally done, your general supply chain consulting, maybe what a lot of you are learning in school, you look at how best to get inventory in, how many inbound warehouses you want, where those warehouses should be. We love a map that looks like this, right? This, <laughs> this generally is known as an optimal supply chain from an outbound side, right? We don't see lines crossing over each other. It doesn't look like a spider web of different warehouses shipping to an end consumer across the country. This is what we've always lived for. And we come in, and many of you within your own companies have initiatives to try to save money in this network, right? And if you can save 5% or save 10%, you get a big bonus at the end of the year. And you've done a really good job for your company trying to, trying to squeeze out costs, whether it be with your suppliers, optimize the warehouse, etc. But what we're missing out on here is really, again, the larger picture. So I just wanted to give some statistics just in case you come from various companies and you want some benchmarks when you do your own supply chain optimization. In our consulting department, we went back five years and we looked at all the consulting studies we've done to try to get some averages and determine what do companies actually save when they optimize the part of their supply chain that we work most on, which is the outbound. And so we see that on average, when a company looks at what they're sending and starts using ground instead of the air products, sometimes you know you've gotten something from a, a retailer or a pharmacy or a law firm down the street and you look at the label and you see the next day air and you think, wow, that's interesting. They could have gotten here on the same day with ground, right? And yet they use next day air. It happens. And so there's an opportunity for a lot of companies to evaluate when they're using the air product and downgrade it to ground. UPS has a ground delivery commit time. And we can see companies save about 4% when they do that. That's, that's an easy change. A no-brainer. We then look at companies who look at where should their DCs be, their warehouses. And we do a lot of greenfield studies. Not that companies are usually going to up and move their warehouse as a result of a study, right? But really good to analyze where, where are your warehouses in comparison to your customer population. Some of you have been involved in those studies. Of course, what we find is that the companies like putting their DCs Nearest, next to the ski resorts out in Salt Lake City because that's where the owner wants to go, right? <laughs> but, you know, that aside, we find that if we look at where they are versus where their perfect locations would be, it could be about 12, 14% savings on average across the board. Some are going to say more, some are going to say less. But if you've done your own studies, these are some, some general benchmarks just so you can look back and say, hey, how did my company do? Have we done this in a while? A gentle reminder. If we do both this mode optimization, this air to ground, and looking at where the warehouses can be, on average is a 17% savings, which sounds like a lot, right? Sounds like you could put that on your resume on LinkedIn. Save my company 17% on their outbound supply chain costs. But again, it gets back to the bigger picture here. And what we find is as supply chain professionals, we spend most of our time trying to squeeze the costs out of, out of a supply chain. Right? And yet that has very little effect on the share price of our companies. Even for the companies with billion dollar supply chains, that number really isn't driving the share price. Right? It affects it. Absolutely. <coughs> supply chain costs go up. The investors ask questions. Investor community can throw some arrows. Right? Share <laughs> price drops a little bit. But in the long run, it's not going to move the needle on the share price the way the top line revenue does and top line sales and margins, especially in the, retail, in the retail world. So we have this dichotomy usually between the supply chain teams, very focused on cost, focused obviously on speed 
and quality and brand to a certain extent because the brand is hurt. If a consumer like one of us in the room is itching to get that latest order that we made online and it comes a day late, right? The brand does suffer. But really, where do most supply chain professionals spend their time? It's up dealing with cost. So let's, let's look on the other side now. And let's look at if you're in the C-suite. So there the tables are turned. You're spending your time talking to your, your own internal team, to the investment community, about top line revenue and sales. So our job, and our ch I challenge to all of you in the room at various points in your careers, is to bring these triangles closer together. Turn them upside down. Put your business cap on. Instead of thinking purely about cost, let's, more, let's look more at these business objectives. OK, we've got a little time before the food comes. So I want all of you to take out a pen if you have it. We're going to do a little quiz right now. If you don't, your smartphone's fine. So here's my challenge for you. You've just been hired. <coughs> You've just been hired by a new startup. Maybe in your alternate reality, it's a brand new company here in the United States, venture capitalism. Maybe it's a European or an Asian company come to make their, their mark on America. But you've been hired. You're the new EVP of supply chain. So the owner of the company comes to you and says, right now, we're going to have one warehouse only. But my goal is to be able to reach as much of the U.S. population as I can in two days. Because the big retail players right now have their two-day programs, right? We know who they are. So you're going to get your chance to have one warehouse. Again, to optimize the number of the U.S. population that can get your items in two days. Where are you going to put your warehouse? What if you have two, so your budget's expanded? Maybe that opens up the east and the west coast. East and west. You have the opportunity to do two. Put some state or some city names down on your pad there, and we'll see. And here's the next question. With those two DCs that you're going to sponsor, how much of the U.S. population do you think you can hit in two-day ground? So not air. Air can get anywhere in one day or two days, right? And two-day ground to keep costs low. What percentage of the country do you think you can hit from two DCs? Okay, final question of this segment. If you could have as many DCs as you want to, what's the optimal number to be able to hit 99% of the U.S. population? Within two days? Within two days. Two days. So that includes one day, includes two days. Yep. Optimal from like a standpoint of cost overall? Yeah, yeah. Too many DCs, duplicate yeah. inventory. We'll make it more complicated, no more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thorough too analysis. many? What's the problem with too many, right? Let's maybe, maybe you guys learn this in school. What's the problem with too many warehouses? Too much inventory. Yeah, yeah. duplicate cost inventory. Cost go up. More operating costs. Exactly. Inbound costs go up. you got to bring those container ships in, those container cartons into multiple nodes, multiple end destinations. It already goes down to the law of diminishing returns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, extra management, extra, you're paying rent, you're buying facilities. You don't want more warehouses than you need. You need, en you need enough to have to, for the space that you need for your inventory, but you don't want more just for the sake of more, usually. There's one company trying to change that, right? But, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay, so let's see how we did. You're going to have one DC for the UPS network, which is all I can speak to. The optimal location is Kansas City. A little surprising, right? I don't think I heard of Kansas City in here. I was just thinking yeah, Iowa. Yeah, exactly. Yes. No, exactly. Iowa, same, same area. area. Yeah. Two DCs, throw me some names out there. Two pairs. Denver and Wyoming. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Utah. Denver and Louisville. Okay. Ohio's too far to go. Utah. Oh, perfect. I was thinking Las Vegas and Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Okay. Love it. Utah and Virginia. Okay. Okay, so that one DC, did you catch how much of the country you could get in t to meet in two days with that one DC? It's 60%. So Kansas City, St. Louis, you can hit 60% of the country in two days, which is very good. But the owner of the company says, not good enough. Let's look at that two DC option. So here it is. So now we go east and west, but not as far east as you may think. 
So we go to Fresno, California. And then we go right outside of Indianapolis, Indiana. Sharonville to be exact. So by adding an additional DC, we get up to 80% of the US population we can cover in two days. So now the owner comes back and says, two is not enough because I don't want to just reach 80% of the population with ground and then have to ship air to the other 20%. I'll give you the budget for three DCs. So let's see what happens there. So Fresno, California stays the same. Look what happens comes back. Kansas City comes back, right? And then we go east. So instead of before we had the Indianapolis, now we have the Harrisburg York, PA. Harrisburg, York. Yeah, exactly, York, Harrisburg. We have, anybody who's driven through there knows all the DCs. This is why. Because then we can reach 99% of the US population in two days. So these are the three optimal locations. So if you see a lot of retailers, mid-sized retailers, their footprint is very similar to this. It may not be Fresno, it may be Ontario, California. The locations are gonna shift a little bit. But this is your optimal kind of mid-range retailer footprint. Yeah, so let's let's make sure everybody, and especially the students here, I wanna make sure you understand this chart. So these different colors represent your day's time in transit with a small parcel. So area. yellow is, is our one day area. So from Kansas City, we can hit this area in one day. The brown is two days. So on here, the yellow and brown is good. That's what our owner wants to hit. But you can see, if we go back one, there's a lot of green, right? So it, with two DCs here, you're gonna have whole segments of the country that you're not gonna be able to get to in two days. So your owner doesn't wanna see any green, because green means two things. Green means either a customer that you're not gonna be able to get to in two days, or it means you have to upgrade your shipping to air and spend a little bit more on the small package side, which isn't out of the question, right? You've all got packages from Amazon. You've all got packages from Walmart. Walmart has the shipping pass now, two-day commitment as well. You're gonna get some air packages from both of them. They're not entirely always shipping ground either. So when you're talking about when you're talking about the green areas, yeah. you're talking about huge areas of the country where nobody is. Percentage-wise, that's the key. Right. right. Yes. Yeah, so in this in this map here, eighteen percent of the country is in the green. So that's Florida and in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't get discouraged by the width of the different colors. What's key here is the population statistics. So in this case here, we can hit 80% of the population with two DCs, but that 20, that green, mm -hmm. is what we need to make a business decision about, right? Also the um, cost for restocking. So if I'm more inland and if I have intermodal imports coming out to the sea, then I'm better off staying on the coast. That's right. Absolutely. That would be a trade-off, right? If yeah. I'm in Kansas City as one warehouse that's right. rather than being on the coast. Yes. Yeah. So that's where it's very important to realize this is our fantasy world where everything is very simple in life, right? We all know from being out in our jobs, there's dozens of factors that have to be considered. That's why you find folks are, are going through and learning these optimization algorithms to optimize 24 equations at once, right? There's so many factors. There's the inbound air freight, inbound ocean freight, DC cost, tax breaks for where you're gonna put your DC, right? Labor costs factor into where you're gonna have a DC. Again, where the CEO wants to go skiing, there's so many different factors. So this is purely our fantasy world here where we're only worried about the outbound supply chain in an e-commerce company. Does that make sense? So the, so the, the CEO or the founder comes to you and says, well, do you want another DC after three? What happens to four? Can you get me to 100% of the US population? And the answer is, as some of you just made comments, it's not worth it, right? Mm -hmm. You're really gonna get to that 100%. So to get that 99%, you're as good as you're gonna get with three DCs. That fourth really isn't gonna get you any closer. So if I come in another time and see you, so the, the answers to your questions are the three DCs will get you to 98% of the US population. So here's another factor that makes things more complicated, right? So some of you have worked in warehouses. Some of you manage flooding in warehouses, right? Thank you for my groceries, by the way. They always come on time and I <laughs> <laughs> love Crush Direct. Yep. So now there's a new hire to your startup company. It's the vice president in charge of warehousing. 
And what does he tell you to break this reality down that was so perfect for a few hours there? He says, hey, my warehouse cannot fulfill all these orders on day one. The founder has a vision that these orders can come in until 2 p.m. Eastern, and those orders are going to get out the same day. Major retailer doing that right now, right? Amazon's got various commitments. All these retailers have various commitments. But they're all trying to bring that commitment time earlier in the day. So on your lunch hour, you can sit there and shop on your app and make your purchases. You can do it right when you finish work at 5 o'clock and still get your order very quickly. They're all moving into this new enhanced consumer experience world. It's all good for us as consumers. So the founder says to you, or excuse me, the, the new warehousing vice president was just hired says, I cannot actually get those orders out in that time. You don't have a two-day time in transit window because I need one of those days. I'm going to steal one of those days to fulfill the orders. Otherwise, what happens? Any of you guys know this from school? What happens if, if a company takes orders up until, say, 2 p.m. and tries to get them all out the same day? It's massive labor in that short window, right? Nobody wants to hire warehouse associates just for a three hour window, to, or four or even five hours. to be able to get these late orders in and out before a transportation carrier comes to pick up all these cartons. You want smoothing in a warehouse. You want to be able to pay people eight hour shifts. So it gets back to the complications which you just mentioned there, right? So the warehousing VP says, hey, I'm gonna steal one of those days. Now you can only have one day time in transit in order to meet the founder's vision of really getting these orders to the end consumer in two days. So you're going to need to now design a network that's going to get these products to the end consumer in one day. So let's take out your pens, and i got a few more questions for you. So if you say you want to get to 85% of the U.S. population now in one day, how many DCs do you think you're going to need? Take a minute to think about it. What if it's 99? What if you're really going to be the next big name in American retail and be able to deliver everything in a one day time in transit? How many warehouses or shipping nodes? We'll throw that in, an alternative. It doesn't have to be a warehouse. How many origin shipping nodes do you think you'll need? Anybody got an idea on that one? The hit 99? Five or six. Four. Five or six? Okay, four. Okay, we just we just saw three up there, right? Okay, so let's look. Everybody got enough time to think about that? Okay, so here comes four. So with four, we still keep the Fresno. Our Pennsylvania ships a little bit from Harrisburg to Lancaster. Kansas City comes back, and we add in Freeport, Louisiana. That'll get us some of that south area near Texas. So four, you can see, doesn't actually change that two-day time transit population. It doesn't, it doesn't move that needle up, but it does tremendously on the one day. You take a note of that. When we were at three, before, we could hit 36% of the U.S. population with three DCs. And then when we make it to four, we're up to 53. Okay, so here's four, so we're at 53. What if we go to five? Then we're up to 62. You see the difference with five? So we shifted a little bit. We bring, we bring one into to southern Georgia. We bring in Albany. The others shift a little bit around. Uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana is there. The city names change a little bit. But, we're, but the big difference here with five is that we bring in that Albany. With six, we're up to 69%. And the big difference here is Virginia comes in to cover that southeast. And then Albany, New York. Yeah, and Albany too. There goes there goes us in the northeast there. With seven or up to seventy seven. Big one was with seven is Des Moines, Iowa. That's gonna get you some of the, the northern central plains area there. Eight's gonna get you up to seventy eight percent. We're getting we're getting closer to that eighty five that we talked about earlier. So eight brings in Orlando to make sure we can cover Florida. Still got some green up here, doesn't really concern us. We're just itching away, trying to make this match the yellow and the brown. So this green just got dramatically smaller. So with green, we're really, really, we're, sorry, we're trying, we're trying to get rid of 
the brown here. This yellow is increasing. So here we go, we're nine. We're getting closer. 82% of the U.S. population we can hit with nine DCs. So here we brought in Austin, Texas to get down southern Texas. And then with 10, we're going to add in Michigan. So at 10 DCs, we can get to almost 85% of the U.S. population. But we're not going to get to 100. There's still a long way off. There's still a lot of investments that somebody would have to make to be able to really get that number higher than 85. And who wants 10 DCs anyway? We just mentioned from an inbound perspective, from a management, from a real estate perspective. Nobody wants 10 DCs. Even the largest retailers in the country right now, they may have 10, but I'll tell you why they have 10. They have 10 because they have automated conveyable facilities where in some cases there's robots, in other cases it's material handling systems. Very automated, the cost to serve is very low. But then they need the non-conveyable facilities for the larger items, and so there's a split. They may even have two DCs in Georgia, for example, but it's not to cover the geography differently, it's because the buildings are built differently. And as they've grown, they've had to expand and had to go into new buildings. It's an entirely different problem. Okay. So your average retailer, again, 10 DCs is just too unmanageable. So what have the retailers done? What started happening maybe 10 years ago? It's not a genius idea by any means. But what does the retail industry have that the other industries don't? Brick and mortar. Yeah, brick and mortar. They have their stores, right? And so many of them said, hey, let's use our stores as many DCs. We have inventory in there. And particularly when we get up to a large number of DCs, even five. They really don't want duplicate inventory in five DCs. That's just not efficient from an inventory staring, a caring standpoint. So even five, you know, we went to 10 here for the, for the effort, and, and here's actually the full chart. You, so the answer to the final question is, you really need about 30 DCs or 30 origin shipping points to be able to be within one day of 99% of the population. You're never going to be near that, that one guy in Montana, right? But you can get there if you've got 30 origin shipping locations. And do these retailers? Yeah, they absolutely do, right? So we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about this evolution that's been going on, but the retailers still aren't where they want to be. And we know that as e-commerce consumers, based on the packages that we get to our house. So I want to be very clear as I go into this next section, any customer names, company names that I mention are because of general public knowledge, Wall Street Journal articles, for example. I am not going to talk about anything that we know within UPS from working with these retailers. So we all got that understanding. So when I talk in generalities, it's based on my experience. When I talk about exact company names, it's all based on public information. I have NDAs with all these customers, right? I'm not here to, to give away any specific insights that I shouldn't. Okay, so somebody comes up with an idea within one of these retailers and says, hey, let's ship from our stores. It sounds so simple. So in the past, an e-commerce customer such as yourselves here in New York goes online, makes an order, the DC ships it, probably $4 shipping costs for ground, and now, what's the most common sense thing to do? Go to the nearest store to your house and pull the inventory from there if it's available, right? First thing we gotta do is check to see if it's available. Talked about the beginning, how they're split between the retail side and the online business unit side. They had no cross connectivity there. They didn't need to exist before. So when you're placing an online order, that was a completely different inventory management system. It didn't know what was in the stores. There was no way to know if that jacket was in the store here in Manhattan to be shipped to your house. So that's the first big milestone that these retailers had to overcome. And again, let's get back to our theme for tonight. Maybe you're not in retail, but it's the theme of overcoming obstacles from the supply chain side, as Gary talked about that can change the company indefinitely. So what happened when some of these big retailers went live on their very first day of ship from store? Some people call it omni-channel. <coughs> omni-channel embraces a whole lot of ideas. So I'll go back and forth and call it omni-channel sometimes. But what I really mean tonight is a ship from store model. 
So what happened when, when one of the big leading names in women's fashion went live with their ship from store implementation? They dropped 500 orders to a store in Manhattan that day. They forgot to program in a cutoff, right? The store associates weren't prepared for 500 orders. So we're gonna start going through some of those lessons. And if you've been in retail, feel free to chime in here during our, our last segment here. So what we saw very quickly was that all these business rules needed to be programmed should have never even be, been thought of before. There were no systems to manage and make these decisions automatically behind the scenes. You couldn't pay somebody to sit there and make a decision. You order a jacket from Long Island here, it's not worth to pay somebody to sit there and make a decision to look in inventory and make that decision should it come out of let's say Brooklyn or Manhattan, maybe there's a store in Sepulchus, New Jersey, where should it come from? That needs to be automated. The first, the second big step was automating <coughs> some of these decisions. And then you still find today, the very best retailers are still tweaking these algorithms. So we're gonna go through some of the rules that they've learned the hard way and that they're starting to program in case maybe you end up in retail supply chain or end up next year or later in your career, entering into this new world. So here's, here's now we're gonna put on our business caps. What if it's March? And in New York here, we're still cold and shivering as I am right now under the air conditioning. And jackets up here in New York are still selling at full retail price. Because on your business woman and businessman's hat, what do you care about as a retailer? Margins, selling at full retail price, gross profit. You care about inventory turns in the stores, sales per square feet, year over year, same store sales. Those are all the metrics that you're paid off of, right? If you're on the retail side of the retail industry. But let's look at March and what happens in Atlanta in March? It starts to get warm. What happens to those jackets <coughs> on the store shelves, on the store hangers in March in Atlanta? They get marked down. They start to get marked down, right? They need to clear that space out for all the summer items coming in. So markdowns aren't necessarily a bad thing, but you want to sell at the most premium value as much as time as possible in retail, right? So here's a better way of thinking at inventory. While it traditionally made sense for my jacket order in Brooklyn to come from Manhattan because the shipping cost was $4 and the time in transit was one day, it actually make, makes more sense to pull that jacket out of inventory in Florida in this case here, or in Georgia. Pay more for shipping, maybe $8 for ground. It's not going to be that one day time in transit, but it could get back to our hypothetical situation before two days time in transit, still make a customer very happy. But that's a big change in the supply chain world, right? When your KPI is all about decreasing supply chain costs, it's a big leap forward to look at the company's overall business objectives and say what's really important to this retailer is top line sales and not discounting and full margin. And protecting the brand. And protecting the brand Which, as well. Yeah, if you're, you know, you name it, fill in the blank at a high, on the top line brands, you don't want to sell your product as a, at a discount. So we have these, so there's been this evolution. Instead of, at the beginning, it was let's pull from the inventory in the store right next door to really what's the larger perspective here. So now we're looking at weather algorithms, trying to predict the weather for the next month. If it's March, is it going to be a hot <coughs> end of winter here up in the Northeast? Are they going to have a cold spell there and suddenly everybody's going to rush out and buy their jackets again? All these things are being factored into. So from industrial engineering, supply chain standpoint, it's, it's heaven, right? These are jobs for all of us. This is something that the industry still hasn't figured out and that is gonna to continue to be tweaked over the next couple decades here. We talk about some of the rules that we need to factor into these algorithms. What do you think safety stock is? Do you guys know that? Mm -hmm. 
So let's put ourselves in the picture. Let's put ourselves in the seat of a retail store associate to understand their world, which is supply chain, by the way, because you're fulfilling an order here. What would be very frustrating to you? You get an order drop down on the order management system, the OMS, and it tells you to go find this brown jacket. And you walk out to the store, and it's not there. Are you supposed to continue looking? You're on the clock. You've got store customers coming in. You don't want to ignore them. You're on commission. So you certainly can't ignore the customers. And so the retailer has to look. Again, it gets back to efficiency. We need to know that that store, with a certain level of certainty, has enough of that item in stock before we send the associate out to find it. Right? So one's not a good number. Is it two? If we're talking a Louis Vuitton purse, maybe two is a pretty good number because you have really good control of your inventory in a Louis Vuitton store, right? If we're talking a large big box retailer and a box of Pampers, two boxes on the shelf, is that a good safety stock number? Likely not because a customer could come in and swipe those two off the shelf and then the e-commerce order cannot be fulfilled. Right, so there's no perfect number here. You could add zeros to these numbers. On the left here, you could take them away. It all depends on really what the retailer is selling. But identifying this level of safety stock is the next big hurdle for the retail industry. And again, this is pure supply chain here. So some of them are saying that they want a 95% confidence ratio before they're gonna drop an order to that store. Some of them are saying, no, that 5% time, I'm not willing to have that associate out there looking for something. I want my safety stock level to be at a 98%. They're never likely gonna get 99.9 .9 because it's just not efficient enough, right? Or depending on what your inventory is. So that's really the next big hurdle. So who in here goes to Home Depot or Lowe's, right? Some of us do. You guys will one day when you own your beautiful houses out here on Long Island. If any of you stood in a section looking for that one little screw, that pipe, you're gonna fix your, your toilet that weekend and yet you need that part and you're just staring at that area and you cannot find it, right? So you call the guy or gal over in the orange or in the blue, can you help me find this part? And what happens? They stare as well, right? <laughs> so now picture this. Anybody, any of you see the Wall Street Journal article? Do you know what percentage of Home Depot e-commerce orders are being fulfilled from stores right now? Guesses? Over 40%. So imagine how big these Home Depots and Lowe's are. They're sending associates out into normal inventory that you and I shop from to pull these e-commerce orders. And why? It gets back to that customer experience. They want that customer to have that one day time in transit. They've said this is a business objective of ours. It may not make sense from a labor standpoint, right? You go on tours. You see automated warehouses. You see automated material handling systems. You see inventory being pulled in an automated fashion. Little or no labor in that case. Automated shipping systems, manifesting systems, great material handling systems that'll package up the carton, seal it up, weigh it, put a label on it. Very little labor involved. You just imagine now you have to pay an associate. Walk out there in the warehouse, find the item, Come back, package it, right? You have to store all this packaging. Did we think of that? You guys have worked in warehouses. How many number, what's the average number of carton sizes that you'd normally have? 16, 20, sometimes eight, depending on what warehouse you're in. But in a retail store environment, do you think you have room to store 16 different box sizes? Not, not really, right? They gotta find a way to, sh to actually ship, meaning produce a shipping label, put the label on the outbound e-commerce order so that a carrier can come and pick it up. These are all hurdles that the retailers are going through. And again, this is all- Imagine you're Macy's and your safety stock says there's 95% level of certainty that this blue blouse, brand XYZ, size eight petite is in that store here in Long Island, what are the chances of it actually being hang, hanging on that, that on the hanger? It could be in that pile 
in the changing room, right? And so they, that's why safety stock is so important. You don't want to risk somebody going out looking for that blue blouse if there's just one hanging on the shelf. So absolutely, changing environment. So that's what I hope to open up everybody's eyes today. It's the traditional lessons that we all went to school for that have been applied in a traditional supply chain. Now we're looking at the evolution in the store environment and applying those same challenges in a, in a very new way. So let's talk about a few other things. Put your business cap on. If you haven't worked in retail, it's probably important to explain how those store associates are credited. Sales per hour, store managers rated on, on the labor costs. So think of those operational divisions that we keep referencing. You think these retail stores actually wanted to fulfill e-commerce orders at the beginning. Put your store manager hat on. Wait, you're telling me you're going to pull my sales associates off the floor with customers to go on a wild goose chase for inventory that may or not be where it's supposed to be. You're going to have them come back, spend their time putting into a box, maybe putting filler in because we don't have the perfect size box, putting tape on, going into a computer, clicking a few buttons. Ideally, they don't have to type an address because it comes in completely automated, but they still have to get a shipping label. They have to apply it on for a box. Then they got to stage it for a UPS driver and interact with that driver when he comes to pick up the packages. How many of you think the store operations did jumping up and down cartwheels when they were told they were going to fulfill e-commerce orders? Not likely, right? So that's why we're here again to talk about as visionaries of these companies, in some cases it was the CEOs who said in order for me to compete with the Amazons of the world, I have to get a one day time and transit model. In other cases, they looked at their inventory and just said there's excess inventory. I'm, I'm depleting, in that example we had, I'm depleting inventory in my warehouse where there's old inventory sitting in a store because the seasons change. And in some cases, on my website, it's saying I'm out of something. Whereas the stores have plenty of it. I just can't take advantage of that inventory, and so it gets marked down. Or the opposite. A customer walks into a store to buy a certain item, maybe saw it in the catalog, and the store associate says to the customer, I'm sorry, we don't have that in your size anymore. Meanwhile, the, the e-commerce DC's got a dozen of them, right? So stock outs are major metric that the retailers are measured on. And stockouts, for those of you that may need a refresher on the term, is when a customer walks in and cannot complete the sale because the item's not there. Right? Happens to us all the time. You go find that TV you want. Maybe it's an apparel item. Could be an iPad, actually. Apple's been known to have their challenges, too. Uh, and so these retailers had to overcome that. But in work, having these departments work together to look at the vision for the company and say, we have to get there to where we all work together or we're not going to survive in the next day and age of the retail evolution here because these big names are changing the world so quickly underneath us. We have to make this evolution. But there are positives as, as well, right? Some of you are doing a ship to store order on the internet these days. You don't want to get something at home for some reason. You want to get it in the store. You go pick up the you go pick it up in store, but it's still fulfilled like an e-commerce order. You can return it right there if you buy it in store. It's driving traffic into these stores. So what these companies are learning are these aren't actually competing business objectives. They work very very well together. But let's talk about that other major milestone. Who gets credit for the sale? Was the other big one that the retailers had to overcome. So we talked earlier about those store associates and store managers. They get credit for the sales they make when customers walk into the store. They didn't get credit in the beginning of this evolution when they fulfilled an e-commerce order. So what was happening? Store associates and the store managers would say, oh, you know, just tell corporate, just type in the system, couldn't find the inventory. Go back to doing your main job, which is selling. Because they weren't incented to fulfill e-commerce orders. So it took a few years for some of the major retailers to get over this hurdle. Others still have not overcome it. So it gets back to the metrics have to evolve in order to meet those top line business objectives. So now you've got store associates 
who have in their metrics and their measurements fulfilling e-commerce orders. What are some of those metrics? Accuracy, right? Timeliness. What's the one thing that's worse than not getting your e-commerce order on time? Yeah, opening up the box and finding it's the wrong product, right? Yeah, wrong sizes, wrong color, not at all what you wanted. It's happened to all of us, right? So what's that? Damaged. Damaged, absolutely. So that accountability and that accuracy metric is now on the store associates measurement. We talked a little bit earlier about package sizes. And I just want to go into now some of the technology. So we talked about the hurdles, but let's talk about some of the great things that are coming out of this evolution and some of the, the next generation technology that is, that is evolving very quickly. So we talked about that store associate going out, maybe it's in Home Depot, trying to find that, that one item. It is very difficult with just a SKU number, right? You know how hard it is for us to find what we want. If you're just dealing with an eight digit SKU number, very difficult to make sure that they, you're really fulfilling the order. So what's them, what a, a best practice that's evolving is to have the handhelds and the exact picture of the SKU shows up on them. So the associate can have that visual check. There's scanning that can be involved through accuracy with these handheld scanners. Again, all to improve the customer experience because nobody wants to get the wrong order. And in addition to that is accountability and, and tracking for the, the time study. So industrial engineering supply chain, it's, this probably goes back to some of you that graduated in years before these fine folks are. Time studies were a big part of supply chain degrees, right? Industrial engineering was the basis of what industrial engineering was built on. So these retailers need to study the amount of time it takes the associates to go out and find these items to punish them if they take too long. Nobody's assuming the associate's out having a chit chat on the floor, but they need these statistics to be able to improve the, their processes. Maybe there's better signage, there's better, there's better training protocols that could be rolled out. But these items, these, these handhelds are, are really doing a good job in capturing all of the, the, uh, the metrics there. So packaging we just talked about, right? So who would have thought in these big box retailers that they would have room for an on-demand packaging system? And, but let's step back. How well have you seen an on-demand packaging piece of equipment before? Has anyone? No, okay, so let's explain this. So traditional warehouse, 16 different part and sizes possibly. In many warehouses, it's up to the associate to choose the box size right, based on his experience. And that training takes a long time for the, for the associate to gain that experience. Other more experienced or, or, or more robust systems will suggest a box size to that warehouse associate so we can grab down the eight, grab down the 10, and pack right into it. Very easy when you're just fulfilling an order with one item, right? What if there's three items, four items? really takes a lot of good judgment experience on that warehouse associate to be able to pick that right box size. And what we find with studies in are there's about 25% to 50% of the inefficiency based on their decisions. So this company Pack Size, which UPS has partnered with, has created an on-demand packaging system that feeds in layers of corrugated, and it works in two ways. If you're a sophisticated company, and again, we don't need to just talk about retail, we talk about any product here that comes out of a warehouse or an e-commerce environment. If you've got the dimensions of the SKU in your system, then it can automatically cut the right box size and determine exactly the perfect size box for that, I that item. Another step up, if it's a multi-piece order, is it can use algorithms to determine the best way to pack those items together so that there's no wasted space in that end order, that end box that goes out. In a worst case environment, what you'd have, and this is still better than anything that's been out before, you'd have a Cuba scan. So have you seen Cuba scans? You've got the overhead scanner that do the weight and the dimensions. So it can just bring the inventory along and dimensionalize it and then cut the right size box. So let's paint this picture here. <laughs> Here's a before, here's a skid with the number of e-commerce orders. 
packed by a very experienced warehouse associate. Here's the same items packaged by a pack size on-demand packaging system. Same skid, same items. You can guess it's about 50% savings, right? So who would have thought, getting back to this, this is a fusion, maybe these have gotten smaller in the most recent years. Who would have thought a large retailer would have had space for one of these? But the largest retailers are testing right now with companies like PackSize because the, the studies are showing them to be so beneficial. You mentioned damages, right? Damage reduction, fill reduction. These companies have chief sustainability officers. There's a title you can all aspire to one day. Right? Nobody wants to open up a box at home and get peanuts all over the floor, or even these plastic bags that have to be popped and thrown out in the garbage. So with this emphasis on sustainability, this perfect size packaging creates a very good consumer experience. So I wanted to just give a case study here from an actual company that's using three of these machines. This isn't in the store environment right now. We're just, some of the statistics are just coming in from a warehouse just to paint the picture. So you got, you got savings all over the place. You got transportation savings, right? Because in the transportation world, it, we charge based on size of the boxes. So you reduce the size, you have savings there. You got the fill, those bubble packs, those peanuts that don't have to be there. You got corrugated savings. And in the end, for this one warehouse we're talking about here, they're on track to save $4 million in transportation fees by right-sizing their packaging. So, a uh, little takeaway, you may run into this sometime in your career if you don't right now, uh, but the industry is headed here. And from a consumer experience, it's a really good movement because nobody wants to fill up their trash cans at home. Okay, I'm coming down to the end here, but just to kind of sum up this evolution of the retail industry, when we saw how, we see how far many of them have come, but there's still many retailers that haven't even started their journey yet, right? They're not fulfilling e-commerce orders from stores yet. They're only starting to think about it. It's a tremendous job opportunity for you students. We see the next big change coming. What's the next change? We spent a lot of time at the beginning looking at a two-day model, a one-day model. What's the next big change? Same day. Same day. Same day. And it's here in New York, right? Yeah. I can get almost anything I want right now, yeah. same day in New York. <laughs> And then we have half an hour. Half an hour, yeah, two days. Somebody's got a two, a two hour, two hour yep. commit time right now, right? That big name out there. These windows are just shrinking. So what we're seeing is maybe the retailers think they're catching up to the big guy out there, but he's just progressing. And he's taking the e-commerce experience to a whole nother level. And so that's where we need to be in our careers, right? We cannot just focus on our own KPIs and our own metrics. Yes, they are important. And yes, we need them for our own reviews and our own merit increases. But if we're really gonna be leaders in our companies, we have to be able to step out of our own individual silos here and look at the full business picture of our company and say, where are we going? And how are we going to help it evolve? And how are we going to take it to the next level? So whether you got that EVP title that we, we fantasized about it earlier in reality, or whether you're a student or a manager, you can do massive change by going out and working cross-functionally and understanding what the metrics are. I talked earlier about all of the retail store metrics, right? A lot of the supply chain professionals, vice presidents that we consult with, large retailers don't truly understand what their store counterparts are held to and accountable for. We find supply chain experts that specialize in inbound. You posed some great questions earlier. Inbound sometimes doesn't know what outbound is doing. Doesn't understand the warehouse metrics of throughput and labor. So wherever you are, you can look back at what you know and then look forward to think about what do I have to know to become a true business professional and a true supply chain strategist and not just a professional in supply chain management?